Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. India hosts special meetings of the United Nations Security Council's Counter-Terrorism Committee in Mumbai and New Delhi. Pakistan taken off global watchdog's grey list for terror financing. And Indian security forces foil infiltration bid along LOC in Jammu and Kashmir. India hosted a special meeting of the United Nations Security Council's Counter-Terrorism Committee in Mumbai and New Delhi, which discussed the overarching theme of countering the use of new and emerging technologies for terrorist purposes. The panel also discussed terror financing through cryptocurrency and use of drones in the new age terrorism. Take a look. 14 years ago, Mumbai witnessed one of the most shocking terror attacks. Several citizens from 23 countries lost their lives in a period of four days. In fact, the entire city was held hostage to terrorists who entered from across the border. India chose the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel for hosting the anti-terrorism meet, which witnessed the participation of several ministers from across the world. The UN Security Council meeting began on with a Solomon ceremony at the hotel, where the participants paid homage to the victims of the 26-11 Mumbai terror attack. 26-11, let it be a reminder to all of us of our unfinished work in holding accountable the perpetrators of its horrors and averting future terrorist attacks like it on any of our people, anywhere. India gave a detailed presentation on Pakistan's support for terrorists involved in the 26-11 attacks at the meeting and also played an audio clip of Sajid Mir, one of India's most wanted terrorists, directing the Mumbai terror attacks. India's Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar said the task of bringing the perpetrators of the 26-11 Mumbai attacks remains unfinished as the main perpetrators of the ghastly terrorist attack continue to remain protected. Terrorism may have plagued several regions of the world. We, in India, understand its cost more than others. But with that experience comes the stealing of national resolve. Decades of cross-border terror has not and will not weaken our commitment to fight back. Our real tribute to the victims will be to rededicate ourselves to combating and eliminating the menace of terrorism, and this by stronger determination and joint action. At a time when the world is distracted by Russia's Ukraine war, the two-day anti-terror meeting helped remind the international community that terror groups continue to threaten world peace. And though many groups, like the Al-Qaeda and ISIS, may be lying low at the moment, they can resurface any time. It is important for countries to stay one step ahead and put in place a system to counter the use of new technology by terror outfits. Since 9-11, the UN has been actively engaged in encouraging countries to work together to fight this couch. And it's not just about vigilance and security focused on those that carry out terrorism. We know, we understand that depriving terrorists of the funds to carry out such attacks, the funds to maintain their network, and the funds to recruit new members. The special meeting served to reflect on recent developments and the latest evidence-based research regarding the threats posed by the use of these technologies for terrorist purposes. Pakistan has recently been removed from the grey list of Financial Action Task Force, the world's terrorism financing watchdog. The Islamic nation was listed in 2018 because of strategic deficiencies in countering money laundering and terrorist financing. Has Pakistan really taken adequate steps to curb terror financing or it has just completed bureaucratic exercises? Let's find out. Indian security forces carrying out anti-terrorism operations in Jammu and Kashmir is a regular phenomenon. 
they have been fighting against terrorists who infiltrates from Pakistan on a mission to bleed Jammu and Kashmir. These armed terrorists are trained, financed and radicalized in Pakistan who have been rejoicing its successful removal from FATF's grey list. After its two-day plenary in Paris, the FATF declared that Pakistan has fully completed the 34-point action plan. However, experts call it a statistical bureaucratic exercise which Pakistan has successfully finalized. This is one of those statistical bureaucratic exercises where if you tick a certain checklist, it doesn't matter what you've done. Uh, it just shows that you've somehow controlled terrorism and therefore, well, terror funding, and therefore you're out of the list. Whereas we know that Pakistan would have found alternate routes of funding that same terror. This is a classic case of how, you know, how viruses tend to outpace uh, uh, antibiotics. This is one of those cases where slow bureaucracies will never be able to compare with the nimbleness of terror organizations and terror funding. The United States has identified Pakistan as a base of operations and target of numerous armed non-state terrorist groups, some of which have existed since 1980s. According to the Congressional Research Service, notable terrorists and other groups operating in Pakistan are of five broad but non-exclusive types. They include globally oriented, Afghanistan oriented, India oriented, domestically oriented and sectarian, that is anti-Shias. US State Department's country reports on terrorism 2020 which was released in December 2021, notes that Pakistan did not take steps under its domestic authorities to prosecute terrorist leaders residing in Pakistan. It said that Pakistan made limited progress on the most difficult aspects of its 2015 National Action Plan to counter terrorism. Pakistani deep state has managed to build a worldwide infrastructure of, uh, I would say, organized crime. And uh, they are beneficiaries of this kind of thing. I don't think internal institutions of Pakistan are in a position to restrain them. They have managed to brainwash uh, their whole generations and they believe that uh, Pakistani dabbling with terrorism and organized crime is something which enhances the glory of Islam. A uh, very strong pocket of Islamic radicalism they have managed to create where no questions are asked. Since Pakistan remained on FATF's grey list, several top terrorists, including Hafiz Saeed, Sajid Mir, Zakir Rahman Lakhvi, Masood Azhar, and Abdul Rahman Makki, remained invisible. It is believed many of these UN designated terrorists, who run their own charity organizations, will start collecting funds to promote terrorism and Islamic radicalization. They enjoy the patronage of Pakistan security agencies who use these outfits as their proxies. Terrorism is not a law and order problem. It is an act of war and it's a very low cost and deniable kind of war. So I doubt that in days to come, Pakistan will dismantle them. And even if these uh, specific individuals uh, are not seen uh, as frequently or even if their influence erodes, Pakistani deep state is in a position to replace them through some other proxy. The United States and India, both victims of terrorism, are trying hard to root out terrorism by sanctioning its perpetrators. They are making efforts to blacklist these terrorists under the 1267 Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee of the UN Security Council. Unfortunately, China, an all-weather friend of Islamabad, plays holes and blocks on bids by India and its allies to list Pakistan-based terrorists. Despite all efforts are high to continue a fight against terrorism and its perpetrators. The spread of fanaticism and increasingly regular terrorist attacks are causing panic, fear and hardship around the world. 
pressure is being put on those countries with terrorist ties to eradicate radicalism in order to preserve international peace. Let's explore how and why China and Pakistan continue to remain staunch allies in their efforts to encourage terrorism and obstruct world peace. After paying tribute to the victims of the 2611 terrorist attacks at the Taj Hotel in Mumbai, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated that there is no justification for any kind of terrorism and that doing away with terrorism should be a top priority for all nations in the world. Ten members of the Pakistani Islamist terrorist group Lashkar-e-Taiba carried out 12 synchronized bombing and shooting attacks over the course of four days in 2008 in the financial hub of India. Nine attackers were among the 175 fatalities, while more than 300 people were also injured. Terrorism is absolute evil. There are no reasons, no pretexts, no causes, no grievances that can justify terrorism. Terrorism is absolute evil. And terrorism has no room in today's world. So I feel deeply moved to be here, where one of the most barbaric terrorist acts in history took place, where 166 people lost their lives. The UN chief's words were a responsible call to the world to be vigilant to the threats of global terrorism, and they were endorsed by many. However, actions in the United Nations by a few member nations were not aligned with Guterres' speech in Mumbai. It came as no surprise that China and Pakistan undermined India's efforts in the United Nations to combat terrorism. Beijing recently blocked a U.S. and Indian resolution calling for the blacklisting of Pakistan-based terrorist Hafiz Talasayin, the son of the architect of the Mumbai terror attacks and Lashkari Taiba chief Hafiz Saeed. Observers familiar with UN processes claim that China is abusing its position as a permanent member of the UN Security Council in order to halt the inclusion of Pakistan-based terrorists on the Sanctions Committee of the UN Security Council's Al-Qaeda and ISIL Daesh organization. Pakistan refuses to answer questions at international forums about the terrorists that it harbors within its territory. When questioned during the 90th Interpol General Assembly in New Delhi, about the extradition of organized crime figure Dawood Ibrahim and on turning over Hafiz Saeed, the Pakistani delegate kept quiet. Hafiz Saeed and Dawood Ibrahim most wanted in India. Do you want to stop India? While speaking at the conference, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, however, called for international action to stop the financing of terrorism. When threats are global, the response cannot be just local. It is time and it is high time that the world comes together to defeat these threats. Friends, India has been committing transnational terrorism for several decades, long before the world woke up to it, we knew the price of safety and security. Numerous terrorist organizations such as the Al-Qaeda, Jaishi Mohammed, and Lashkari Jangvi continue to thrive in Pakistan. Pakistan has applauded its own efforts over steps taken to combat terrorism on numerous international venues, including at the United Nations and the Financial Action Task Force. And although the FATF has recently removed Pakistan from its grey list of terror financing and money laundering after four years on the list, Pakistan still gives shelter, money, and training to terrorist groups. India has been a victim of cross-border terrorism for more than 30 years. India, with an eye on global safety, 
has regularly informed the United Nations about its neighbors' continued indifference to investigations into the financing of terrorism and to the prosecution of senior commanders and leaders of UN-designated terrorist organizations. India will not be phased by China and Pakistan's tactics and will continue to hold the countries accountable for their roles in global terrorism. Let's now turn our attention to the Union Territory of India's Jammu and Kashmir, where the Indian security forces have started a number of counter-terrorism operations to destroy the network of Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. Islamabad is making a concerted to launch infiltration attempts in the region, but the vigilant Indian security forces are putting an end to these terrorists with a commitment to upholding peace and tranquility in the area. A report. The neighboring country of Pakistan and its proxies have made repeated attempts to disturb the peace in the Jammu and Kashmir region. Terrorists are being given funds and training so they may sneak into Jammu and Kashmir and assault security personnel and civilians. However, observant Indian security forces consistently thwart infiltration attempts and eliminate terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir, putting a stop to Islamabad's nefarious efforts. Recently, the Indian Army, along with the Jammu and Kashmir police, foiled a major infiltration attempt by park-backed terrorists along the line of control in Kupwara district. Based on specific information from the police, corroborated by other intelligence agencies regarding the infiltration of a group of the Lashkar terrorists, security forces launched a joint operation. Around 1.45 a.m. on 26 October, the infiltrating terrorists were fired upon, resulting in the elimination of one terrorist. However, taking advantage of the darkness, the other terrorists managed to flee to the POK side. Police also recovered an AK series rifle, two pistols, ammunition, and warlike stores from the site of the encounter. Indian security forces are in full command of controlling the borders and all the infiltration bids that Pakistan, with the help of its ISI and Rangers, is trying, is, are being foiled very well. We have seen, especially since the time the operation All Out started, the point was that whatever infiltration has been done or tried to be done by Pakistan, the infiltrators have been killed either at the LOC or at the no man's land or even if they have managed to infiltrate inside, they have been caught into the grid system that is being laid out by the Indian Army. Jammu and Kashmir has witnessed a rapid development since after the abrogation of Article 370 to end its special status. There was also a decline in terror-related incidents and cross-border infiltration. However, in the past few days, there has been a spate of incidents when terrorists have targeted many civilians, especially from the minority community. As per the report of South Asia Terrorism Portal, 804 incidents of attacks by terrorists have taken place in Jammu and Kashmir in the last three years. The highest numbers of incidents, 321, were reported in 2020, and 209 incidents have taken place till September this year. With the crackdown on separatists and the center's move to restore Kashmiri Pandit's land, terrorists are under pressure to make their presence felt through fear. This is why terrorists backed by Pakistan are escalating terror-related violence in Kashmir. This has occurred in the last three to four weeks and coincides with the situation in Pakistan. Their economy is in doldrums, inflation is at its peak, the army is being openly questioned. These instances have never happened in Pakistan. So a diversion is created by engineering attacks in Kashmir. 
that after the abrogation of Article 370 and the way that things, the development that has taken place in the Kashmir Valley and Jammu and Kashmir as a whole, the people of Pakistan have started asking their rulers and the uh, army over there as to you were saying that Kashmir Banega Pakistan here it now appears to be that Muzaffarabad is going to become India, Hindustan. So this sort of a thing that is coming up, the protests that are coming up in Pakistan, the ISI and the army and the political class that is over there think it better to keep diverting the attention of the people of Pakistan by sending in infiltrators and terrorists over here in Kashmir Valley. The underlying factors of Pakistan's Kashmir policy have remained unchanged since the first Kashmir war. Its diplomatic efforts both bilaterally as well as raising the issue at various international fora have been limited to malign India and to portray that bilateral approach have failed. Islamabad must end material support for terrorism in Kashmir if regional peace is to be assured. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Uzma Jafri signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.